Again, welcome everyone. We're gonna take another 30 seconds or so to ensure that all the audience uh, has joined uh, the webinar. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Horning and I'm the executive director of Wild Earth Guardians. I'll be the host of today's webinar. We have guardian supporters from all over the country and all over the West taking part in this webinar. Uh, it's a delightful silver lining of uh, this pandemic that we can connect with the guardians community um, all over the country and sometimes all over the world. In these Wild Earth webinars, we like to bring together national issue experts and people from frontline communities and elected officials uh, sometimes as well and Wild Earth Guardian staff to talk about a critical issue at a critical time. We've got a great crowd today. We've got a great uh, set of panelists here. So I'm excited about today's discussion and conversation. Our purpose, as always, is to inform, inspire, and activate guardians like you to help us advance our vision and create the kind of world we want. I'll be taking questions from the audience on the half hour and towards the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. I'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, and participation is a, a cornerstone of these webinars. So again, please bring your questions. Today, we'll be talking about wolves and both the rise in animosity towards them and the ongoing efforts to protect and celebrate these magnificent creatures whose presence on the land drives ecosystem dynamism and inspires millions. 2021 has been a particularly challenging year for wolves and wolf lovers after the Trump administration stripped federal protections in October, 2020, the state of, of Wisconsin authorized a hunt that resulted in 216 wolves being killed in less than 60 hours. This spring, the states of Idaho and Montana passed new laws that allow for bounties, baiting, trapping, snaring, and other cruel killing methods as well. Nearly 2,000 wolves could be killed in just the two states of Idaho and Montana. Already we've seen three members of Yellowstone National Park's Junction Butte Pack, the most viewed and celebrated pack in the world, killed on Yellowstone's border. Something is deeply wrong when the bumper sticker slogan, smoke a pack a day, becomes public wolf policy in Montana and Idaho. With me today to discuss these matters are Bonnie Rice, Carter Niemeyer, and Sarah McMillan. Bonnie is the senior campaign representative for the Sierra Club. She's uh, on the National Endangered Species. Uh, she's on point on endangered species nationally for the club. She also directs their advocacy efforts on wildlife and public lands in the Northern Rockies. Also with us is Carter Niemeyer, who's a retired US Fish and Wildlife Service wildlife biologist. He's also a former government trapper. In 2001, he was put in charge of the Fish and Wildlife Service's wolf recovery program in Idaho, uh, coincidentally retiring in 2006 on the same day that wolf management was handed over to the state of Idaho. And we have our very own Sarah McMillan, who is our conservation director and our former legal director and directs all of Guardian's conservation efforts to protect species, public lands, wild rivers, and um, do our part uh, to address the climate crisis here in the American West. So welcome to each of you. It's great to have you. Okay, I wanted to start this webinar with um, a little bit of a personal question, but also one that's embedded in uh, this moment that we find ourselves. As I said in my introduction, we're in a difficult place for wolves. So I'd like to start with a question for each of you. Um, you each are devoting a, a critical part of your life's work to wolf protection. 
So I'm really curious to hear how, how you're doing and how you would describe this moment. And why don't you go first, Bonnie, then Carter, then Sarah. Hey, thank you, John, and hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, I think, as you said, it, it's a challenging time um, for wolf advocacy right now. And I guess just personally, I would say that um, I'm a little tired, but I'm very determined um, because this species really needs our protection. And um, so, yeah, we're just going to continue to fight on, you know, with every tool that we have in terms of, um, you know, our advocacy efforts and litigation, working with tribes. And, um, you know, we're going to get protections back, you know, for, for gray wolves. And so just very committed to that. You know, this moment in time, I think, um, I think a lot of people are really operating from a place of fear and hostility rather than coexistence and compassion toward wolves and, um, and leaving science behind. And so I think that is part of our challenge is to really make sure that we restore that, you know, to its rightful place in wolf management. Thank you, Bonnie. That was beautiful. Carter, how about you? Well, I call myself a realist. I've been immersed in this uh, wolf recovery effort for almost 35 years now in one form or another. And uh, I know how it works out here on the ground in Montana, Idaho and Wyoming. That's where I've spent my career. And I guess I'm really leaning toward environmental law is, is where the solutions are gonna maybe have to come. The states are unrepentant, unapologetic, and unsympathetic. And uh, I sense that at every level. And, and though there's a lot of good biologists in the field, in the rank and file, th there's many that don't like what's going on. But um, people got to realize that, that what's happening these days is coming directly from the state legislatures. Um, I hate to put it bluntly, but I mean, it's these are Republican dominated legislatures. And I, I just see uh, there's been hard feelings about federal overreach doing the wolf reintroduction in the first place. And I, I just sense right now we're, we're dealing with uh, retribution, payback, the states are in charge. And uh, I give up talking to them, you know, at, at the legislative levels, they're not listening. And it seems as so each time you ask them to be sensible, they come back at you with something more bizarre. And, and uh, so I, I guess right now, you're gonna have to find chinks in the armor in, in uh, dealing with public lands, environmental law and, and see, uh, if people can come at it that way to resolve some of these issues with uh, uh, and Dan Ash, you know, he, he kind of coined the word in his opinion piece in the Washington Post, he calls, calls it uh, Idaho's anti-wolf virus and it has spread to Montana and uh, Wyoming's doing its best to, to catch it too. So yeah. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Carter. I, I, I appreciate the, the, the perspective, and I like the unrepentant, unapologetic, and unsympathetic perspective uh, of, of how you see the states. Sarah, what about you, opening reflections? I echo what both Carter and Bonnie said. We need science, we need law. They will serve us well in the protection of, of wolves in particular and wildlife more broadly. Um, I'd also just add that I do think we are in this moment of a cultural shift moving away from the long history of dominion over wildlife towards one of coexistence. But there's a lot of turbulence in that transition. And in a lot of ways, I think what I feel like what we're seeing is these state entities, legislative commissions um, and agencies <clears throat> trying to drag us back into the dark ages of wildlife management. And I'm, I'm personally 
I find it incredibly painful and heartbreaking when you hear that we already have over 60, we have 61 wolves killed in Montana so far this year. Um, and just the, the, the bloodlust that is behind this frenzy to kill wolves is so deeply distressing. Um, so I want also to be insistent and determined and it's also painful to see that all the time. Thank you, Sarah. I think it's important, uh, and I wanna say something in, a, in another moment, but I think it's important to share the grief and the sadness and, and the fatigue, cause it's real, we're all feeling it. And as my brother says, who's a therapist, you gotta feel it to heal it. So um, I am, am, each of you have touched on the realities of the Northern Rockies. Well, here's what I wanna say to the audience. We're gonna spend the first, another five minutes talking about what's wrong. And we're gonna spend the, the remaining 40 minutes about what we're doing about it. And so I just wanna be clear that the first 10 or so minutes is really about grappling and confronting the harsh reality we're facing. We're not gonna stay there. So uh, the situation in the Northern Rockies as you've each described is appalling. I think it'd be good and you could start Bonnie to describe a little bit about what's happening and how it came about? Yeah, and I can definitely, especially speak to Montana um, being based here. Um, yeah, what we've seen, I think, is just, you know, with what Carter was mentioning and just, you know, a real shift here, I think, in the political landscape, um, you know, after the last national election and, and we got a new governor. And um, the, the legislature became more, you know, dominated by, uh, I would say, anti-wolf forces, you know, and people who really are more in the domination and, and not the coexistence camp. Um, and so as a result, I think we've seen a real shift in here in Montana. Um, we used to think that, and Montana used to be a little bit more different than Idaho or Wyoming in regard to wolf management and management of, of native carnivores overall. But unfortunately, we're just seeing a real shift away from science here and toward, you know, just wildlife management by ideology. And um, so a lot more extreme measures were passed by the legislature in regard to wolf management earlier this year, um, including allowing things that have been allowed in, in some of the other, you know, neighboring states, but we hadn't seen in Montana, such as snaring and night hunting, um, paying bounties for dead wolves. You know, all those things are reality now in Montana as well. And um, so that's, you know, that's obviously really troubling. And, you know, we're working to, you know, to fight some of those. I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more in terms of some of the litigation. Yeah. You, you talked, Bonnie, about how Montana once had a proud history of, of science-based wildlife management. It is discouraging to see what's, what's happened there. Carter, I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, the perspective from Idaho, given that you've, you've uh, had more familiarity with, with the state of Idaho, just how would you describe what's, what's happening and how it came about? And I imagine the themes are gonna be similar to, to Montana. Well, going back in the history of, of uh, wolf recovery, wolf reintroduction, uh, there's a clear historic documentation, if you go back on the internet or go back through the legislative records, that Idaho was opposed to the wolf reintroduction since day one. They tried to stop it before it ever happened. Uh, at one point, uh, the Idaho legislature wrote a bill that directed or instructed the Idaho Department of Fish and Game to not participate. They were forbidden to be involved in the reintroduction recovery effort. And that's how the Nez Perce tribe stepped to the plate and said, give us the funding, we'll fill that role, that niche. And, that, and that's what happened. So uh, all during recovery in Idaho, the Nez Perce tribe was really our field crew of uh, technicians to document the growth of the population. And then uh, as long as they were listed, I guess we had some poaching and, and other, you know, 
atrocities carried out, but it was not significant compared to the prolific, resilient nature of wolves. But uh, of course, when they got delisted in 2011, uh, it was liberal from the start, and then it's just been step by step. Uh, you could kill five, you could kill 10, you could have 20, you can have 30. And, and today, uh, one individual in Idaho, you can kill 100 or 200. Uh, there's no limit on, on uh, how many you can get. And as mentioned a little earlier too, I mean, all no holds barred. You can trap them, snare them, call them, um, I'm not sure there's any legality as far as aerial hunting them yet, but wildlife services do. And so Idaho has just uh, kept pushing the extremes of uh, it's nothing about fair chase, it's not about sport. And it's driven by a fallacy, and this is some of the workshops I've been working at. You keep telling people, you know, the elk populations in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming are, are doing well. There's as many or more elk today as there was 26 years ago when we reintroduced wolves. And the livestock loss, you're talking tenths of 1%, mm -hmm. as low as two tenths of a percent. And yet now we have a bounty system that, that started here in North Idaho where they're paying, uh, last I heard now, they've received so much money from the legislature that they're gonna maybe pay bounties as high as $2,500 per wolf. And then you keep the wolf. Uh, wow. So nobody's listening about, um, you know, we don't have an elk problem and, and the livestock problems are, are minuscule by comparison. Yet the workshops I go to and, and the anti-wolf component that come to them just absolutely defy the information I share. They're not listening. And uh, so these bounties through the group that's paying for it, uh, you know, are justified because they're saving elk from decimation. Yeah. And they're saving yeah. the livestock industry. It's amazing how myth and cultural perspectives that are intergenerational are fueling so much of what's happening with wolves and, and wolf policy. And that's, that's challenging stuff to overcome. So I, just one more question actually for you, Carter, and then maybe a, a closing one, a brief one for both you, Bonnie and Sarah, before we get to the positive and what we're doing about it. I know a, a month or so ago, you shared a, a pretty tragic story about the killing of some wolf pups in Idaho. And I'm wondering if you could share that for our audience, some of whom may have already heard about it. And if there's anything new that, that you might share and you can spare the gory details, but I do think we do have to confront some of the ugly realities and individual stories can be quite, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not looking to torture people, but I do think it's, it's worth sharing. So at the appropriate level of detail, if you could briefly share that, Carter. Well, yeah, well, it all come about was uh, a year ago, this past summer, I uh, took a, an LA Times reporter and his fiance with my wife and I out to howl wolves, uh, just to give them that first experience in Idaho. And anyway, I'm gonna try and make this story short. Um, this was in an area where the Timberline Wolf Pack lived uh, north of Boise, about an hour's drive. And uh, we showed up, we were able to howl at the wolves, but also found wildlife services were in their radio collaring a wolf. Uh, and anyway, this Timberline pack, the significance is that uh, I collared the first wolf in that group in 2003. So they've been around for 18 years, more or less. And uh, when I caught that wolf, uh, Suzanne Stone with Defenders of Wildlife at that time asked, can, can we name the pack, the Timberline pack, in behalf of the mascot uh, the wolf for Timberline High School here in Boise. So I said, sure, let's, let's call them that. So Timberline High School then uh, kind of adopted that pack and, and have followed it over the years. And then uh, the science teacher at the time was Dick Jordan. And so he started inviting me to come and do field trips with his students in the winter. And we went up in the Timberline area and looked at tracks, looked at elk. Uh, so anyway, um, between last spring and this spring, 
uh, Wildlife Services, I guess, decided to remove wolf pups to save the pack, you know, instead of constantly killing the adults, which they've been doing over the last 18 years. There's been, the pack has been uh, constantly persecuted for killing sheep on public land. And the wolf pack is a public lands pack. So I'm gonna come back to public lands over and over and over. Uh, so anyway, most recently the uh, pack was controlled, you might say, by Wildlife Services this spring by going into the den and killing pups, I believe in April, and then actually following the wolves because there's a collar in the, or one or two collars in the pack, I'm not sure. And then as the wolves move their surviving pups away from that den to a rendezvous site, uh, Wildlife Services shadowed them and using a rifle killed others. So uh, Timberline High School, I, I talked to Dick Jordan who'd retired and Suzanne Stone. And, and so Timberline High School decided they're, that they're gonna fight this thing. And so they're uh, confronting the legislature. Uh, they're confronting some ag groups that wanna debate them. And uh, some of this went on, I think, the last few days, and I was in Colorado, so I don't know the outcome. But yeah. uh, without going into any more detail, that's kind of what's going on. And, and so here's another approach, having school kids fight for their wolves and maybe the wolves for everyone else, too. Yeah. You know what? Actually, there are many layers of injustice to that story that would require more time to, to dig into but I actually leave it with a little more hopefulness than I thought I would just hearing the story about the kids at, at Timberline High School. So thank you for, for sharing that. I wanna shift, actually that's a perfect segue, just in the interest of time and our commitment to leave people and have the bulk of our time focused on what we're doing to end that type of persecution and foster, as Bonnie said, a culture of coexistence. So I wanna start with um, some unanticipated good news. And Sarah, um, we had a trapping, a legal settlement that focused on trapping. And uh, as I said, had some unintended consequences. Why don't you speak to that? And then Bonnie, you can follow on that with some additional litigation that focuses on other species that are uh, surrogates for wolves. But you go first, Sarah. Sure. So um, in 2013, <laughs> we brought a lawsuit challenging the state of Montana's trapping system, the regulations for a failure to protect Canada lynx. Um, Canada lynx were being trapped and killed. Um, and there were some fairly well known specific actions the state could um, implement in their regulations that would protect Canada lynx. So we brought that litigation and Carter and a former wildlife program director and I and Matt Bishop with Western Environmental Law Center had a fairly lengthy settlement discussion after going through all the briefing and everything and um, identified lynx protection zones uh, around greater the greater Yellowstone ecosystem area and then northwestern Montana. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a map there. Um, that those would be areas where additional restrictions would be enacted in the trapping regulations. And they include, and those are regulations that were in place in 2013, 2014. Um, we settled in 2015 and no snaring is allowed in those, those areas that are blue, the lynx protection zones. So after the, um, the commission adopted regulations allowing snaring for wolves, all over, including the wolf management units one, two, three, and five, which are in portions of them are included in these link, links protection zones. We reached out and said, hey, you're not complying with our settlement. Um, so I think as Bonnie mentioned, a, what is it, a week ago now, um, there was a, a hearing, people commented and the uh, Montana, Fish and Wildlife Commission did enact additional restrictions so that snares are not allowed in those areas that are currently colored blue. Um, and I think you can tell that in the, the upper left, glaciers up there, part of it, lower in the blue section and the lower part is uh, 
Yellowstone National Park just below as well. Um, so again, 2013, we were not thinking about this. Um, and it's, it's a, a welcome surprise and one of those unexpected consequences that usually unexpected consequences are negative. Uh, this time it was a, a really positive unexpected consequence of a lawsuit initiated eight years ago. An important increment of protection that doesn't end the hunts, doesn't restore Endangered Species Act protections, but does provide some protection. Bonnie, you've got uh, a, a complementary, a different strategy. Could you speak to that? Um, that Can I add, to, may I yeah. add one more thing, which is just that trapping and snaring and snaring in particular is the easiest way. I think people who hunt and trap wolves will say that trapping and snaring is easier than hunting. And um, so getting rid of snaring, they're the cheapest. Um, and the easiest. Put as many as they want out. So getting rid of that in those regions is, is significant. Go ahead, Great. sorry. Great, thank you. Bonnie. Yeah, as Sarah mentioned, then there's a good outcome then from the commission in Montana in terms of um, restricting snaring on public lands in the lynx protection zones. Um, one of the other things that, um, that uh, wolf advocates are doing um, that can have a good, hopefully, consequence for wolves is um, in regard to grizzly bears and filing a notice of intent for both um, impacts to the lynx and grizzly bears um, and um, filing a notice of intent against the state of Montana. And there's a separate one for, for Idaho as well. Um, but with that, what we are pressing for is that because um, the wolf uh, hunting and trapping season was extended in Montana um, by the legislature and subsequently the commission, um, it would potentially what well, will allow um, the trapping of wolves during a non-denning period for grizzly bears. And of course, those are threatened species um, protected by the Endangered Species Act. And so that's, um, that's the basis of the notice of intent there. Um, the commission recently, as part of the action that they took on lynx, also um, set changed a default date to uh, just to um, December from November. Um, and so that will, you know, hopefully uh, protect wolves for longer and protect grizzly bears, of course, um, before they enter the den. The wolf um, trapping season was also, though, extended on the other end to March 15th. And of course, grizzly bears can be out of dens by then. And so that's part of this notice of intent as well. And we're gonna to continue to, you know, to fight that so that um, the season is curtailed at least in February so that grizzly bears um, will, you know, will not be out of their dens yet. But that can also, you know, we're hopefully benefit wolves if we can get that, you know, that ending season date changed so that it'll be a shorter, a shorter season. No, I think. Everything. Thank you, Bonnie. I think both these legal strategies speak to the bloodlust that is driving the, the two states, because there's no rational thinking about what are our other obligations to other federally protected wildlife. And um, so good on all of these groups for, for working to at least constrain the methods and the time in which these, these cruel tools can be used. So I wanna to get to a couple questions from the audience because I see the chat box lighting up with a couple questions. I also wanna remind our participants that one of our main strategies of almost all the groups that care about wolves is to get the Biden administration and Interior Secretary Deb Holland to relist wolves. So in the chat box, and um, there's a, a link there that everyone, I hope you can sign that petition. We gotta keep the pressure on Deb Holland. So here's the first question. This one will go to you, Bonnie. Uh, it's from Isabella Kuzniak. Is there a partnership between tribes and the wolf conservation groups in the states being discussed? And you can talk about that beyond just the states, but also at the federal level as well. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that to me has been one of the more inspiring um, parts for me personally in terms of um, the work to get protections reinstated for wolves. Um, I think as, as, as most people know, um, tribal nations, indigenous peoples have a very strong connection to the gray wolf, um, consider wolves sacred relatives. And so since they've been very strong advocates in terms of protection of the wolf and getting, and getting um, endangered species protections reinstated. And so since 2019, um, there's been a partnership of many, many tribes and some of the conservation groups also in regard to um, when we saw the Trump delisting rule in 2019 for the lower 48, really fighting that. And um, as part of the strategy it was, what's called what we're calling wolf treaty was created and the full name is um the wolf a treaty of cultural and environmental survival and this treaty now has been signed by over 700 tribal or first nations in the u.s and canada including every first nation in canada and so really it is it's a very strong treaty um and i just wanted to just read one part of it as far as the intent which is to honor, recognize, and revitalize the ancient relationship we have with the wolf. It is the collective intention of we, the undersigned, to welcome the wolf, to once again live beside us as creator intended, and to restore balance to Mother Earth, where we are the stewards and the wolf is a protector of our lands. And so I think that's the, the entire treaty is just really beautiful. Um, I'd encourage folks to the, go to the Global Indigenous Council website to read the text of the treaty. And this picture that was just um, posted was why just we, within- Why don't we put that picture back up if you could, Eleni? But go ahead, Bonnie. Yeah. Um, so that treaty again was signed by you know, over 700 uh, tribal and first nations. And part of the strategy then was to present this treaty to Congress and to the Department of Interior. And so this photograph is from about 10 days ago when um, several tribal leaders uh, organized by the Global Indigenous Council presented the treaty to Senator Cory Booker. And um, he was chosen in particular because he's been an incredible wolf advocate and he spearheaded a congressional letter in the Senate that has um, had 21 other senators signed on to it and is calling on the Biden administration and Secretary Holland to reinstate protections for wolves, including emergency protections um, for Northern Rockies wolves. And so this has been part of a two year effort in regard to creation of the Wolf Treaty and getting all of those signatures. And then also as part of the strategy, if you haven't seen it yet, um, maybe if Eleni can put a link in at some point to the chat, there is a wonderful short video. It's about three minutes called Family that was created by the Global Indigenous Council. And that's something that um, Sierra Club and, many, and Guardians and many other organizations have have been um, elevating, again, to show the, the very strong cultural connections between indige indigenous peoples and gray wolves. And so I'd recommend that everybody watch that. And so this was all just over the last two years to really highlight the importance of wolves to indigenous peoples and to specifically call on um, Secretary Holland and the Biden administration, you know, since they've been in office to, to reinstate protections. It's really inspiring and um, heartening work and, and great to see the partnership and, and um, hopefully results from it. It actually leads me to, to my next question, which you've mentioned Deb Holland, just to remind everyone, she's our first indigenous level, indigenous person to be a, a cabinet secretary in US government history. She oversees, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the agency that could put wolves back on the list of endangered species. And I'd, I'd like to hear from each one of you, even if it's a fairly brief assessment, what your assessment of, of her is in this role as chief arbiter of wolf matters. Why don't, uh, why don't you go, Sarah, and then we'll go Carter Bonnie. 
I'll just start by saying that I think the Department of Interior, pursuant to what happened in the previous administration, was in disarray. And so there's been an awful lot of building back. Um, I know that my expectations have been quite high and they have been disappointed. Um, and I also am tempering that with the reality of the, the sort of the state of the Department of Interior. Um, and I also want more and expect more um, as, as time goes on. Thanks, Sarah. Also, Car Carter, what's your, your assessment of Secretary Deb Holland? Well, in all honesty, I don't really know a thing about her other than what I've read and, and of course mm -hmm. have no inside connections, but uh, just going back, digging up some old history here, I, I want people to be aware, you know, that uh, former secretary uh, Dan Ash came out with an opinion piece on August 3rd, 2021 in the Washington Post under Voices Across America. And um, I kind of had these for notes today too, but he spells out a, 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 quite a list of tactics that he sees, you know, uh, because he was there, he did it, he trusted the states uh, when he was in office, assumed that things would go well and they didn't. So uh, Ash, now in hindsight, he thinks, uh, you know, it's no longer wildlife management concerning wolves, it's ecocide and that uh, states are treating them like vermin. But I think if you go back to his opinion piece, it might, uh, there's a message in that that maybe Deb Holland could uh, look at and uh, see if she's interested in listening to some of his suggestions now. But uh, she hasn't been fooled or betrayed like Dan feels he was when he was in that position. Yep. Thanks for that historical perspective. Bonnie, quick, quick reflection on Deb Holland. Yeah, and I think um, mine is tempered a bit like Sarah in terms of the mess that they inherited. Um, but yeah, I'm impatient, I would say. I really want to see action by the secretary in regard to Wolf. She's hearing a tremendous amount from so many people and so many tribes on this issue and really hasn't taken action yet other than, you know, defending the Trump rule and court, the delisting rule. Um, and undertaking a status review since um, many groups, including the ones here, really pressed for that. What I really want to see is I really want to see Secretary Holland honor the federal government's Indian Trust responsibility and undertake meaningful consultation with tribes on gray wolf management and protection. Absolutely, that needs to happen now. It should have happened already. Um, and yeah. That's, that's really what I want to see is a, is a public commitment to that and to starting that process. I have a good uh, audience follow on question to that, uh, Bonnie, for you. It's from Ann Cahill Makowski. Has Secretary Holland still not met with the Indigenous Council? Secretary Holland personally did not meet with the council. Um, the Indigenous Council and other tribal leaders did have a meeting with Interior um, about 10 days ago, uh, the day after that picture with Senator Booker was taken. Um, that was with the uh, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, but it was not, unfortunately, Secretary Holland, which um, was, was quite disappointing. Yep, that has been disappointing. Okay, I wanna move on. You, Bonnie and Sarah referred to the Trump delisting. I mentioned it in the opening. Um, wolves are gonna be in federal court this Friday. Part of the reason we wanted to have this webinar today, at least figure, figuratively speaking, they'll be in court. Could you describe what's happening on Friday, Sarah, and what we hope will be the outcome of that hearing with this, um, as a part of this critical lawsuit? Yeah, so first of all, I believe it was three separate lawsuits were filed um, by various different groupings of wildlife advocates and wolf advocates. Um, and that was, it was actually, I think we all sent notice of it um, that we were intending to file a lawsuit a year ago this week. And so then had to wait a number of days before we could actually file the lawsuit. So here we are in a hearing um, on Friday. And just yesterday, Judge White issued a list of questions that he had um, identified and asked the attorneys to focus on answering those questions. And they all, it's, it's quite 
complicated and very legal easy, but I will say, I know there are a ton of sophisticated people, so I'm not speaking down at all. I am struggling still to understand the context of all the questions. So, um, but the crux of it seems to be, is it possible to identify um, the lower 48 with the Northern Rockies population excised as a listable entity? So it's super wonky legalese. And what we hope is that the, the conclusion is yes, it, we can list this, this entity, the lower 48 minus the Northern Rockies um, or relist. Um, and secondly, that, um, that the judge will send it back to the federal agency to reevaluate the decision to relist. And at the same time, well, no, that's, that's going to come a little later. I was thinking about the petitions, but um, so that's where we are right now. Uh, super wonky legal arguments um, in California before Judge White. And there will be, it's going to be on Zoom and um, there are going to be a lot of people arguing. And I believe the judge has actually set aside the entire day. I don't know that he will allow the argument to go the entire day, but all of the other hearings have been canceled. So there's nothing else on his docket for the day. So bottom line it for the audience, what's the outcome we want of that litigation? Well, I think the, well, we want the wolves to be listed again. Um, I think the outcome will, if, if we get a good outcome is that it will be sent back to the agency, the US Fish and Wildlife Service to reconsider their decision to delist. And right. that's when we will all have an opportunity if that's what happens to send them all of our thoughts, our, the science, the, the threats, everything that's currently happening in this world, which is a different situation than it was, um, you know, a couple years ago or a year ago when, when the wolf was delisted. So. And in terms of outcome, is that weeks away or months away or years away? You don't have a crystal ball, but tell me what you think. I think the fact that the judge has identified these specific issues that he wants to have addressed, I think he's already leaning one direction. Crystal ball, tea leaf reading, um, but it seems like he's invested enough energy to understand where he thinks the, the sticky legal issues are. Um, so I would expect a decision before too long. And I don't know what that means. That could be within a month. It could be within six months, but... Um, and then it goes back in the process that the Fish and Wildlife Service is uh, painfully long. Yep. Bonnie, anything to add that? Because I want to shift to, to a question for Carter that's from courts to coexistence, but anything to add on the courts? No, I don't think so. Thanks. Okay. Um, um, there's a question here for you, uh, Carter, and it was something that we wanted to bring up. Uh, it's from A.B. Fergus. Carter... Uh, could Carter speak some to non-lethal approaches to carnivore, to carnivore coexistence with livestock farmers? Yeah, um, quite a bit of my time and effort now, and uh, including some workshops I just came back from in Colorado, is, is uh, trying to convey that there is coexistence measures that uh, ranchers can take. Again, it's a tough pill to take any, make anyone take, but I've went out of my way you know, to make contact with the folks who are doing non-lethal uh, coexistence type ranching. And I'm absolutely convinced it can work, but getting people to just do it, uh, it's all voluntary. There's nothing mandatory about it. So we have very, several progressive uh, livestock managers and producers, uh, both in Canada and the US. And I haven't got time to go into them, I guess here, but uh, nonetheless, I've been co-presenting with them and know the, how they're running their ranches, but just using you know human vigilance and checking livestock often, uh, using a range rider system and, um, or like, I know sheep producer, it's gone predator friendly where he's just decided to grow a product and market it as predator friendly. And, and one of the necessities, of course, then you don't call wildlife services or anybody in every time you have a loss. But 
I've got a colleague up in Canada, you know, he, he's got, uh, he's taking care of over 4,000 cow-calf pairs uh, in the presence of a couple of wolf packs and multiple grizzly bears. And his biggest loss is usually a larkspur poisoning, <laughs> you know, wow. so, yeah. uh, but anyway, it can work. These people I know are making it work but it's a tough sell to the livestock industry overall to accept that. Yeah, I think it's really important though that as, as you reflected earlier, as the state legislatures become more politicized around this issue and become more unrepentant and un unapologetic and unsympathetic that on the ground culture changes around fostering coexistence and incentivizing coexistence that that work continues, uh, even as the work in the courts continue as well. It's an important part of the long-term trajectory. So I'll just say, thank you. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, I appreciate it as much as I appreciate the lawyers who will be in court on Friday fighting for wolves. I think it's, uh, as I said, uh, an important part of the picture and Sarah McMillan wants to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think, um, again, it doesn't feel like data and science impacts people the way we all believe it should, but I think it is important to note that there are something like two and a half million head of livestock in Montana, 99 were killed last year by conf confirmed killed by wolves. Um, and so that I don't even, I can't even figure out what that percentage is out of two and a half million it's really, really small. And those people were also all compensated to the tune of something like $75,000. Um, so it just like, when you think about what the problem is, is the problem that wolves are killing livestock or grizzly bears are killing livestock? Um, or is it our perception that that's an unacceptable loss because they accept the larkspur loss, right? They don't expect to be compensated because they put their cows out where they're gonna eat larkspur. So anyway, it's it's a, it's it's this perception of what's acceptable, and somehow native carnivores, if they eat the bread loaf of a cow, um, that's unacceptable. So anyway, some of this, of course, has to do with the cultural context. For you can't vilify and demonize, and there isn't mythology around larkspur. Although I love larkspur, they're beautiful <laughs> purple flowers, but. Um, I, I want to make sure we got a few more, I shouldn't say a few more, a ton of additional questions from the audience, but I have one more question from our set of questions for both Bonnie and Sarah, and I'd like to go with you first, Bonnie. Um, we've talked about legal advocacy, we've talked about coexistence. There's also the pressure on the Biden administration and Deb Holland through the scientific process that is infused into the Endangered Species Act, which allows citizens and groups to petition the agency. Um, what's, speak to that strategy, Bonnie, and, and where things are, and then you can follow on that, Sarah. Yeah, I think that the opportunity now is with the status review that the Fish and Wildlife Service is undertaking, which it, again is just a result of um, a lot of advocates uh, putting together citizens petitions under the Endangered Species Act and, and different organizations um, to force the administration to look at, you know, the changes in the laws in particular in the states. Um, at Montana, Idaho, and you know what that means in terms of wolf recovery efforts, and um, just saying, you know, look, the situation has really changed from on the ground when these states legislatively delisted wolves, and so you have to really take that into account. So there is a public comment period now that is open, um, and. Until they, until they come up with a finding for the status review, which could be up until next May, but hopefully it won't take that long. And that's a status review of, um, of the Western gray wolf population. So that is, you know, that is a way to weigh in, um, certainly with Interior and the Fish and Wildlife Service. The other thing that we'll be exploring, um, you know, as all of us is, uh, is advocacy groups for wolves is what are additional ways that we can work with with the tribes to keep the pressure on Secretary Holland um, in regard to, you know, reinstating protections for wolves. Great. Thank you, Bonnie. Sarah, what would you add? 
I was just gonna add, and, and Bonnie knows this too, but that there are um, six Ojibwe tribes that are also in court in Wisconsin, um, in federal court, and there's also a state court. So that, that hunt has actually been put on hold, at least temporarily, um, based on one of those lawsuits. But I think that's another example of the Ojibwe tribes saying, we're going to actually enforce our treaty rights. Um, uh, and then the other piece is just, there is this, um, I think the 90 day finding that's gonna be issued in the middle of December um, that the, the Fish and Wildlife Service will be responding to those petitions um, at that point. So that will give us a good sense, I think, of where we're going around the, the Northern Rockies and American West populations of gray wolves. So what um, gives me and the audience a sense of when we expect more news in response to these petitions? Um, is it weeks, months, or years? So they issued their thing that says, we're gonna do a 90 day finding on September 17th. So if somebody else can do it, I think they're two days with 31. So it's either December 15th or 16th or 17th, something like that. So mid-December, we should expect some news from Interior that is either good or bad with respect to these petitions from the Sierra Club, Guardians, and, and many other organizations trying to get Deb Holland and Interior to do the right thing in, in that setting, so. And is that what you understand too, Bonnie? I wanna make sure I'm not misstating it. That's my recollection because the decision came out in the Federal Register in the middle of September. Was there, okay, just thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, we're, I wanna be mindful of everyone's time, get a few more questions. Uh, these are, I'm gonna ask two, and I, I might answer them just in the interest of efficiency, but one is from Carrie Palin. What do you recommend that we do on the ground in terms of being persistent? Continue to contact Holland, who's remaining silent. And the other is from Adrian Papermaster. I've already taken all of the actions on the website. What more can I do? I have time and energy for this and I'd love to volunteer somehow. Actually, I'm not gonna take that. What would you say, all, either one of the, the three of you, first Bonnie, then Carter, then Sarah, pe for people who obviously care deeply about wolves and have used a lot of energy, but still have a lot of energy to spare, what, what can they do? Well, I think continuing to keep the pressure on Interior and Holland, I think, is really important as they're, you know, undertaking this status review. And I and I think part of that, if if people haven't already, to really be including the um, the responsibility of the federal government through executive orders and other ways for um, for the Biden administration to enter into consultation with tribes. I think that's a really important message that we all need to be sending. The other thing I would say is because as we've been talking about, you know, a lot of this is now controlled by state legislators, um, you know, the governor, they pay attention to what's in the media. And so I would say for people who can um, to, re you know, if you haven't already to be writing letters to the editor, I think is one way where you can really you know, make your voice heard and that, you know, these officials do pay some attention to what kind of traction issues are getting in the media. And um, so that's just another thing that I would say that's important and that we're always encouraging our activists at Sierra Club um, to really, you know, to take that step and make it more public. Um, so other people see it. And then I think it encourages other people to also you know, speak up. Carter, what would you add before Sarah, you chip in as well? Well, I guess support your conservation groups and support your environmental uh, attorneys. Because, I, you know, living here in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, uh, I get the feeling of helplessness. Um, it just seems like you're talking at people here and and then the problem is too, if you're not a resident of Idaho, Montana or Wyoming, the, the legislature's messages generally are, if you're not from our state, we're not interested in your opinion. And I go back to public lands. I, I still think that you gotta focus on the fact that that land belongs to everyone in this country and that you do have a say because a lot of what's going on 
happens on our public land. So uh, don't forget that angle. I agree with that. I, I just want to echo that point um, that public lands are a, a critical battleground and front in ensuring that it's not just Idaho's values and Montana's values that should be considered on the federal public lands in, in those states and in all the states in this country. And I think the federal government has failed to, to provide leadership in saying that these lands should be managed differently and the wildlife on them should be managed differently. Sarah, uh, just your, your addition to this, this thread. I mean, I guess I would also say get out and do grassroots political organizing. I think of what happened in Montana. We used to have a government, we've always been kind of purple in Montana. So we've always had kind of a wacky legislature, but then we have governors who are not as wacky, but they bring out their branding iron veto and they veto the bad bills. We got a new governor who is just signing all of the wacky bills that come out of the legislature. And so I, I would encourage people to be politically active more broadly, reach out to on your state level, as well as get Cory Booker some more senators to sign on. Like I think somebody noted um, Colorado representatives haven't signed on. They should be signing on. The, the, their state just voted to reintroduce wolves into the state. So um, yeah, get active politically more broadly. I would really second that for sure <laughs> everywhere because we really have to change the political landscape and not just on this issue and not just on carnivores, but on a lot of other things that we all care about. I would echo that, and I'm gonna echo that as a segue to a final two questions that I'm gonna merge into one. And my echo is this, the, the legal forums and the science are things that we will drive in the short term, but ultimately these are political and social problems. And that means that people's voices matter and our elected officials matter. And we're not gonna change the trajectory for wolves unless we change the social context and the political context. So here are my, my question for each of you. It's two, it's, I want you to think on a longer time horizon, not just this election cycle about what needs to happen in our society and in our politics. And that's the first question, but infused with that is, what makes you hopeful about our ability to protect wolves at this very, very difficult moment? I want to I wanna make sure we leave people with that sense of hopefulness embedded in a deeper uh, time horizon. Why don't you go first, Bonnie, then Carter, then Sarah? Yeah, I would think in terms of... In terms of what needs to shift, when I really think about this for the long term, I think it's it's you know it's it's things that we've been talking about in terms of just this whole, you know, the political landscape and just the I think the landscape in our hearts and minds, right? From you know a place of fear and domination of other species to coexistence and compassion, and that we're just one species, you know, on this earth. And so I think in that way, really. You know, it's much more of a, uh, the indigenous perspective that I feel like that we need to get to that, you know, we are in an in interconnected web of life here. And we really need to realize that and internalize that and start acting like it. And that we're, you know, we're not the only species on earth. Um, in terms of what gives me hope, I think a lot of it when I think about it is just the number of people that care so passionately about wolves and that are taking action. Um, and that, you know, we'll come to Yellowstone to from all over the world for the chance to see a wolf in the wild. And that gives me hope. It also gives me hope to see tribes asserting their rights, like Sarah mentioned, you know, in Wisconsin with the treaty rights and speaking up um, that their voices have to be heard. And so I think those are, you know, aside from what we're doing in the courts and um, you know, litigation. I think those are two things that that I really think about for the longer term. Beautiful. Thank you, Bonnie. Carter. Well, I see the biggest problem in this country is, is we're so divided everywhere. It seems like, you know, urban, rural, you name it. Uh, so where I've been putting my energy and helping where I can is is doing these uh, presentations or uh, 
workshops, we call them, like in Colorado. Uh, Got to get rid of the labels. I know that. I mean, when you uh, strike out at ranchers, I mean, you're every time you use a wide paintbrush and consider if you're a rancher, you're evil. Uh, that's getting nobody anywhere because there's a lot of good people that you do meet. So um, that's that's where I say we got to we got to keep talking and we got to keep uh, arranging these kinds of workshops where you can bring both sides in and, and talk about coexistence. But first of all, just see if you got some common ground because this thing of fighting and and labeling people and and hating the other group just because they grow livestock. And I, I'm, I'm not defending the livestock people today as much as I'm using them as the example that uh, they feel targeted and they feel like everyone's out to get them. And uh, some of them deserve it, but there's a whole lot of others that don't. So uh, we got to start trying to understand each other and, and uh, talk it out you're going to get further that way if we get anywhere at all than, than this constant, uh, you know, antagonistic reaction toward each other. The coexistence challenge is a cultural challenge that applies to all of us. <laughs> yeah, just... Even the word coexistence is kind of an inflammatory term. I mean, it's almost, and the thing is, we're all coexisting right now. I mean, when you start talking about it as if it's something we're trying to achieve, uh, wolves are already in every wolf pack intermingles with livestock. So, I mean, they're already coexisting. It's the people that can't get over that. So um, maybe finding better terminology that doesn't create animosity suggesting it. Yep. Bonnie, do you want to add something quickly before Sarah oh, goes? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, you know, Carter, yeah, and to thank you for your work, because I think I think that is some of the hardest work is that on the ground, those very difficult conversations. Yeah. All yours, Sarah, before I close. I'm not sure I have much to add. I'll say maybe additionally making sure that state and federal agencies understand stakeholders is a much broader audience than was traditionally understood to be. And that, as, as Carter kind of suggested, our first response to conflict, because there will be conflict, can't be to automatically write off kill the wildlife. And how we go about that, I'm a little less clear on, and it's the complicated answers. But I want to respond to your question about hope, like what makes you hopeful? So since the other two covered so well, I just want to say things like what's happening in Wisconsin, where that the the hunt got stopped. Um, the Ojibwe tribe are standing up and speaking loud about their treaty rights. Things like Colorado, where the citizens voted to say, yeah, we actually want wolves here. And the Colorado Parks and Wildlife is trying to start figure out how to, figuring out how to welcome wolves back onto the landscape. That's exciting. And that is an indication of, okay, there is this culture shift happening that, that happened in Colorado. And, and I know it's also, there's a ton of conflict in Colorado, so I don't mean to suggest it's all happy, easygoing, la 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 land, but um, that, that gives me hope. <laughs> Great, well, we're aware of the darkness. It's, it's good to be reminded of the light and I, I appreciate closing on, on this more hopeful perspective because as we opened, you know, there's some fatigue and some real moments of despair when you see what's what's happening. So I wanna thank the audience for all the questions. I did not get to about a dozen of them. We will follow up via email with each of you who asked a question. Sorry that I couldn't get to all those questions. We'll have a recording, we'll send this out. I wanna thank the three panelists here. Uh, lovely conversation, I'm sorry we couldn't explore more of the nuance, especially with you, Carter, because there's some interesting work is, that you're doing around coexistence, and that really could almost warrant a whole hour uh, a conversation, as I know I could with, with each of you, Bonnie and Sarah, on this, this issue. And uh, again, thanks for the questions. Just, I want to close with this. We told you that we were bringing everyone together and that we were going to howl. I meant it. We need to howl for, to celebrate wolves. We need to howl for hopeful reasons, for angry reasons, for grief, 
reasons. And so that's how I'm gonna close this webinar. And I thought, I hope each of you will join me. And I wanna say before I go, the last time I really howled, I was on the edge of a canyon in the Gila wilderness of Southwestern New Mexico and two or three wolves howled back at me. And it was the first time that ever happened. And it was an incredibly inspiring moment to know that my mere little wolf howl could incite uh, the response of a wild animal that uh, is as beautiful and inspiring as, as wolves. So here's my howl. I hope each of you will join us before we sign off. Oh! <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate it. Hang hang tough and keep at it. Thank you everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.